the use of JavaScript as a server-side language was being thought again. Like there were attempts in the past to use JavaScript as a server-side language back in the day in 90s, but then it was too premature at that day, at that time. So in 2009, since Java, there was a wave of JavaScript and there were two reasons why JavaScript on server made sense. One was reusing code. Basically, anything that you could write on the client, you would also want to run on the server, for example, validation or any sort of logic. And the other thing was there was, there was a huge community of developers that were writing JavaScript and you could get that benefit of having them write server-side code. So in 2009, server.js or common.js as a group spun up and it worked on standardizing uh, the language for server-side use cases, like adding what about file IO, what about async IO, and modules was one of the offsprings of common.js. And they came up with the first module format, which was common.js or CJS, as I've mentioned in the slide here. <coughs> so alongside common.js, AMD, I mean, I think in less than a year, AMD was also a module format. So common.js, uh, was, people say it was server first and AMD was browser first because AMD let you load modules asynchronously and CommonJS had a synchronous module semantics. So that was how the module system, ecosystem actually start, like, uh, came to rise uh, around 2009. And 2010, I think Node.js was officially released and Node was the first server uh, platform to adopt CommonJS. Now you'll see, in 2015, so I forgot to mention, there was a lot of standardization effort in the early 90s, and there was a standard called ECMAScript, uh, which was created so that you could standardize JavaScript and you don't have any vendor walls. So in 2015, ECMAScript released a version called ES6, which natively supports modules. And from 2015 onwards, JavaScript as a language has module as a first class construct. Uh, most modern browsers today support ES6, but there'll still be a time, uh, there'll be, there's still a long adoption curve from, for folks to move off CommonJS to ECMAScript. And then I've also mentioned Browserify, Webpack, and Module Bundlers. So I mentioned AMD was a module format for the browser and CommonJS was a module format for the server. What bundlers did is they helped you write CommonJS for the browser. So they kind of bundled all your CommonJS modules in one file. That, that was what bundling was about. Am I too fast or slow? I don't know. Okay. All right. So that was about uh, the evolution of JavaScript and evolution of modules. I tried to rush this through, but hopefully we'll look at the lower half in details. So this is, I'll start with some code examples. This is the very first example of, like, think about early JavaScript when you wrote inline scripts, and all I'm trying to do is print a greeting on your page. So you have a submit button, you enter your name, and you get a greeting. So this is all inline script. The first thing you could do is remove the greeting module and put it in a file and have an external script. So I actually have an external script that I'm including in my HTML. Now, um, so if, if, you, if you remember, I had a slide on uh, concepts of modules, right? Separation of concerns, encapsulation. So we'll try to see how different patterns satisfy all of these requirements. So, so far we've seen that we had a script on a page We've put it in a script, we've put it in, in a file, in, in a separate file. Uh, that kind of gave you some separation of concern, but it didn't give you namespacing. Basically, any file that is added to the HTML is in the global namespace. So if some other, other script added a get greeting, you would have collision. So how do you get namespacing? You'd basically move all your functions inside an object literal. An object literal is nothing but an object. Um, and you kind of have key value pairs. But the good thing about this is there's only one global that is in the global namespace, it's the greeting object. Everything else is namespaced under the greeting object. So you, if you can see in my code now, I just call greeting object dot init. So this is how you get namespacing with object literals. 
Before we get into module patterns in JavaScript, I just want to give a prelude to what functions are. So in JavaScript, functions are very special. They're first class objects. They, you can pass functions as arguments. You could return function. You could define function inside a function. And you could assign function to a variable. So just, just remember, functions are just like a normal object. But there's a difference. You can also call a function. And this is kind of the essence of the following slide, which is the module iffy pattern. So we saw that with the object literal, you got namespacing, right? Um, but there's one thing that was missing that was encapsulation. So with the module, uh, with the object literal, you had so many functions that were defined inside the object, but all of them were accessible in the global scope. How do you, for example, not have get greeting? Like how do you just expose show greeting and hide everything else? So what you do is use this pattern called module iffy pattern. Um, and at first, it feels like a lot. I'll break it down into smaller parts in the following slides. But in, in, a, in essence of it, anything inside a function is local to, is in, in the function scope. So you kind of define everything inside a function. And then you only return what you want to, be, what, what do you want to expose as public. So in this case, I'm returning an object literal, but I'm only selecting few functions that I want to actually make public. So let's look at the details of how module iffy pattern works. So first thing is, you would have noticed this weird syntax, right? Like, first let's talk about what function expression is, right? So as I said, in JavaScript, you can have a function definition, which is basically a function followed by a keyword, uh, followed by an identifier. So this is a function definition. And a function expression if, can be anonymous. In this case, it's anonymous and could be assigned to a variable, right? Um, this is one more way of defining a function expression, of declaring a function expression. And here, what I'm doing is I'm declaring a function expression and executing it immediately. So this is an anonymous function expression. Um, and it's invoked instantaneously. Now, the, why do we need this anonymous function? Because you don't want to exp the idea is you want to have less variables in the global scope. Because it's anonymous, you kind of limit one less, if there's one less variable in the global scope. Now, the other aspect of iffy was I returned some methods that were public. But how do these methods have access to the private state, which is basically name, greeting, and get greeting? So that happened. That is possible because of a concept called closure. And what closure is, is in JavaScript, a function has access not only to its immediate scope, but also to its enclosing scope. So in this case, show greetings and closing scope is this function. So it has access to all these variables, even after the function is returned. What is the acronym? Yeah, so it's immediately invoked function expression. Sorry about that. Um, great question. So please feel free to interrupt me if there's some acronym or something that I'm missing on the page. Um, so hopefully you understand how closures work. It, it's kind of the, it's, it's as simple as that, that any function has access to not just its variables declared within, in, within it in its own scope, but also to the enclosing scope. And enclosing is lexical. What I mean by lexical is uh, each function gets access to environment in which it's defined. So that's how you can actually hide things from global scope. You return immediately from the function, and you only expose things that you want to actually be public. So this is a pretty powerful pattern. And you'll see that this module iffy pattern is actually what uh, is used in a lot of modern day mo module loaders to execute uh, modules. Sorry, to implement the module formats. So that's because JavaScript natively doesn't have like encapsulation or information hiding as a construct. So you kind of use a pattern to achieve it. OK, so now that we've spoken about coding conventions and design patterns, so far we're good, right? Like we've got encapsulation, we've got namespacing, we've got separation of concerns. What is missing? Like what's missing in the language? is a standard way to declare dependencies and a standard way to export dependencies. So if you'll see, 
So far, there's only one way where modules talk to each other is globals, right? Like, even in the IFI pattern, I am exposing a global, and my HTML expects a global. So globals were the only way modules could interact with each other. And that wouldn't scale. Like when, when you want to run code on the server, when you want to run code on cross plat on across different platforms, this format is not interoperable. You needed a better format to declare modules and consume modules. So that's when we'll talk about common JS. So common JS has everything that we spoke about, separation of concerns, encapsulation, namespacing, and it also includes two other constructs, which is explicit dependency reference in the form of a require. So here is a module called greeting.js, and it requires display, so it depends on display, and then it exports a few things. This is explicit export declaration. So this is what I was talking about when I said that a module should export and define its dependencies. But wait, how does this run in a JavaScript environment? You need a loader, because JavaScript doesn't understand require and doesn't understand what module is, right? So you need loaders. And one of the first loaders that implemented CommonJS was Node. You had a loader called Montage require a loader for the web. But we'll see that it was not, I mean, there were other reasons for which it was not quite popular. Now let's look at how CommonJS loader works in Node. So the trick here is actually an iffy. So what Node loader does, it wraps your module code. So this was your module code, right? It wraps your module code in a function and then it invokes that function with two arguments, which is require and a module, and a few other arguments which are, I'm not going to, which are not relevant to this talk. But if you think about it, this is an anonymous function right now. What, what the node loader has done is it has taken your module source, wrapped it in a function, and then it's going to pass a definition for require and a definition for module. Let's go a little bit more into the details. So this is how the required function in Node would look like. The first thing a require module identifier would do, it would try to resolve the module identifier. By resolution, I mean trying to look up, like if you do dot slash display, what file in the file system does it map to? So identifying the, apps, uh, the, the path where I should look up. So resolution is basically identifying identifiers uh, and mapping them to file paths. Think it's as simple as that. And then Node has a cache. So every time a module is loaded, Node would cache the module, and the next time it look up the cache to see if it's present in the cache. If not, it's going to read the module source, wrap it in the anonymous function that we just saw, and then call the wrapped source. I've missed two arguments here, with require and a module object. And finally, it's going to cache the result for that module. So this is a simple example of how a common JS loader would be implemented in Node. I've got a good diagram that I picked up from the net. Uh, this is a link of how require works. And you could see that this, basically, it's a pipeline of operations. You do resolution, loading, wrapping, evalu ev evaluation, and caching. So we saw how common JS could be implemented in a server environment. But you can see the problem right here, right? Like the resolution is a synchronous operation, and the required syntax is synchronous. Um, so common JS was not necessarily very, people called it as a server-first module format. Although there were module loaders for common JS, its companion, AMD, was gaining popularity as a module format for the browser. And what AMD said was, it provided a mechanism for modules such that the module and its dependencies can be asynchronously loaded. So that was like the defining distinction between AMD and CommonJS. And there were some arguments around like why it was better for the browser. Here is an example of AMD. So AMD2 requires a loader. So AMD is again a module format. You require a loader to actually understand this module format. And the loader that was very popular in that day and is still popular is require.js. 
it's called RequireJS. Okay, so the module format has a concept called define, which is a module definition. And whenever a module is defined, you can specify its dependencies in an array. And then once those dependencies have been loaded, you have a callback that gets executed. So JavaScript has, um, if you're familiar with asynchronous programming in JavaScript, you have this concept of callback. So every time an async operation gets completed, you can call the callback. So in this case, what the AMD loader would do is first fetch, um, is first fetch all the module definitions for the dependencies and then run the callback. An AMD loader like RequireJS does a simple thing, uh, very simple implementation. It adds a script tag for every module dependency that it sees. Uh, There's nothing complex under the hood. So these are my functions. I have a greeting, I have a display, and then um, what I've also done is I've moved my event handler logic in a file called main.js. So if you remember in my HTML, I had an on-click handler. I just moved it to the handler to a main.js, and then I can assemble my code. It's pretty simple. I just require require.js, and then I say the first script module that it needs to pull in is main which is this file, now comes the picture of the, now if you remember the module graph, I spoke about the module graph. So what the module loader would do is, it would actually start from greeting and walk the graph. So greeting then depends on display, and then display depends on nothing. So it's, it's going to actually walk the graph and fetch dependencies for you. Um, that's, that's why the module graph is important. Uh, because that's how the loader would know how to fetch everything that the application needs. So, yep, this is an example of, I think I'm, I'm too fast. Okay, I'm ahead of time. Okay, all right. So, yeah, this is the example of AMD. Uh, what about common JS? Like, we saw common JS uh, as a, we saw common JS as a format, how do you run CommonJS on the browser? So there are bundlers that let you um, bundle all your CommonJS modules in one file and make it available for the web app. So Browserify was one of the first bundlers that let you require modules in the browser by bundling up all your dependencies. It was quickly followed by Webpack. Um, any questions so far? Okay, all right. So we saw that there was AMD, there was CommonJS, and now we're going to look at what bundlers do. This is an example of a CommonJS. Uh, let's go back to the CommonJS files that we had. So we had a greeting.js, and we had a display.js. Greeting depends on display. And then I also have an event handler JavaScript file called main.js. What it does is basically looks at a button and then calls the show greeting method of my greeting module. You can see how all of this is namespaced. I'm not relying on any global, but I require a module and I use whatever is exported from the module to actually run the function, right? So there's no reliance on globals. Now, what I do is I have all these modules, right? But then, as I said, the browser doesn't understand common JS format. So what you would do is you would use a bundler like Browserify, and you would specify the first entry to the graph, or the first root node to the graph. In this case, it's main. And you'd say that, hey, bundle the entire application in a single file. So this is my output option. And I'm saying, hey, bundle it, and the output should be called bundle.js. So now I can have an HTML, and the only file that I need is bundle.js, and I'm good to go. So yeah, that's about bundlers, and this is the module graph. So now I'm going to go into the details of what happens inside the bundler. So this might be a little bit of, it might seem intimidating, but let's break it down. So as I said, you have a module graph. Main depends on greeting, greeting depends on display. And what the bundler would do is, as I first thing that we all discussed, it's, it's going to wrap all your modules in a function. So you can see 
the bundler maintains a module map. So this is an output of Webpack, by the way. Uh, and it's, it's a stripped down output of Webpack, so it doesn't have everything. But you can see that here is an object, and it has some keys. It has the module identifiers as the keys. And the values are the wrapped functions. Remember we talked about how you wrap a module in a function to get local scope? So here, you see that you wrap your modules in functions. And each of the wrapped modules get two definitions of require and module. So far, so good. Now what happens is this entire Webpack code is nothing but an iffy. So you look at a function here, and that function gets invoked with the module map. So the Webpack runtime is wrapped in an anonymous function and invoked with the module map, right? So what the Webpack runtime then does is it first has a definition for what this require really means, right? So it had, you remember the require, we, we walked through what node require does, it's very similar to that. So it has a definition for require, and then it executes the very first file. It executes the very first entry point, in this case, main.js. So it kind of does the, think about, Webpack does the module graph traversal twice, once at build time, when it actually builds this file, and then at runtime, right? When at runtime, it will first start with main.js, and then main.js requires, uh, I don't have the code here, but main.js requires greeting, greeting requires display, so then it's going to execute each of those modules one after the other. So this is very simple. Everything in, in module world is actually an iffy. Uh, you can you can think of it as an iffy, right? Because that's the way you get a local or a private namespace that modules need. So far, we're good. Yeah. So here it says that it Webpack requires invoke main.js. Yep. Main.js is already uh, part of this code, right? Yeah. How does it know when exactly? So main.js is below here. Yeah. Yeah, so if you look at what Webpack require function itself does, so you see the fu this function gets this, uh, this module's object as an argument, right? So this function gets this entire object as an argument. And inside this function, you actually look for modules of module ID. So you look for, right? And then, how does it get? Uh, so I have actually not listed the source here. Let me let me show you the source. Hold on. So main.js actually requires greeting. Correct. Okay. So it's part of the source. It's part of the source. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I wanted to keep the slide a little smaller, but yeah. So you still retain the source here. Okay. Um, yeah. So if these are the are actually the fundamental blocks to modules in some ways. But no, sorry? A question here. Now, when you, when it bundles all this, yeah. when you're debugging it, yeah. isn't it very difficult to debug this? Uh, well, that's a very good point. So, <laughs> that's a good point. You can still debug it because you could still place breakpoints in, in each of these sources. But Webpack also has a concept of uh, source maps. Or actually, source maps is not just Webpack. It's a general concept in, in the web debugging world. So what source maps do is they map a line number and a column number in your bundled source to what's in your file system. So source map, if you, if you generate Webpack in a development mode, you, you can also use the source map option, which is a separate file that gets shipped to the browser. And then when you click on a breakpoint here, it'll actually open up what's in your file system. Uh, so source maps is a way to do debugging, but this, you can still place breakpoints in each of these sources, right? So like as soon as you, you if you place a breakpoint in main.js, as soon as the page loads, you're going to stop the page. But great question, I like it. All right, um, so that is about bundlers. We saw what loaders are. And I think the browser, in the browser world, 
AMD was one of the popular loaders, but uh, for a lot of reasons like performance, in this, in the module bundler world, everything is pre-packaged, right? Like the assembly happens at build time. When you use a loader, you assemble it on the fly. And it, it, it was a little expensive in the early days to get all your modules asynchronously. Uh, so module bundlers were one of the selling points was, hey, if you pre-bundle your app, you're going to have a faster time to render because you don't have to go and fetch your modules, right? And there was one more benefit of using a module bundler. As I said, code reuse, right? Um, so when you write code for the server, you're probably going to write common JS, and then you probably want to reuse that same code in some way in your client, right? Like there might be something that is common. And if you use a bundler, you can use common JS, which is the same format. But not to say bundlers were also are, are also pretty powerful, and there's use case for everything. Uh, wow, well, this is ES modules, which is ECMAScript modules, and this is not, um, so CommonJS was a, a, vol a volunteer community that spun up a revolution, kind of in, in terms of standardization, but not until 2015 was modules uh, part of ECMAScript, uh, it was released as a part of ECMAScript. And if you see, the syntax differences is you have import and export. In, in common JS, you had require and module.exports. And the other important distinction, uh, so ES module is very similar to common JS in that it's a synchronous format. You don't have callbacks. You still have to synchronously load your modules. But there are, um, and I want to talk about one more difference. If you want to run ES modules in the browser today, you'll have to use a format called MJS. Uh, and not JS, and you don't need any bundling because most browsers understand the ES6 module format, so you don't need a bundler if you want to run uh, ESM modules. It's similar to AMD in that each module will be fetched asynchronously because you don't have a bundler, but given that most JavaScript engines are highly optimized today, the constraints around async loading are not the same as they were when, in the early 2000s. So you could see in my JavaScript file, I only have a script type module, source main.js, and my main.js is similar to common JS, except that now it uses imports and export. Uh, with that, I actually want to point out to some very important differences between common JS and ES modules. So common JS, the first thing is it's a module format of the present. There's a lot of apps written in common JS. ES modules, there is a lot of adoption for ES modules. So most browsers have ES modules implemented. Node has an experimental version that's released. Soon going to be, uh, a, minor, soon going to be a minor release. And I think ES modules will be supported by most platforms very soon, like in, in the next couple of months. So it's not a matter of vendor support. It's just about adoption. Like how, do, how, does, the web, how does the community move from common JS to ES modules? So that's the second point. But the first point is, this is really, really important, is that common JS supports dynamic requires and exports. What this means is in common JS, you could require a variable slash bar. And what the loader would actually do is evaluate the variable and then, so you kind of require your module code to be evaluated before you can actually get the dependencies in, right? Your module graph is not static. It depends on few variables. And similar with exports. In common JS, we can export an object, and that object could be anything, right? Like, so the, it's pretty dynamic. But ES modules only support static imports and named exports. So what this means is you can use static analysis tools to catch type errors, to do, like, lint checking or you could do a lot of, you could analyze your entire module graph at build time. And then other interesting aspect, aspect is you could build advanced optimization to eliminate dead code. Because now you know what exports are actually used in the module graph, you could remove un, unused exports, for example. So that's called tree shaking in the module bundling world. So ES modules have some pretty powerful use cases because they have static imports. And 
they're going to be the language, they're going to be the model format of present and future. So it's good to start investing time in understanding how ES modules work. Um, and they're natively supported by browsers. So it's, it's pretty good. Um, we should just try to see how we can use ES modules going forward. All right, I am going to talk about conclusions. Um, all right, this is again. All right, so <laughs> I think, so yeah, like I think the problem right now is that um, it's still, you, you, you should use it because you'll be an early adopter of it, but depends on the scale of uh, your project, right? Like, um, because ES modules have, has not been in the wild for long, uh, the, the performance benchmarks are not well established. So I think if you use it in your projects, you'll be one of the early adopters and you'll help move the, uh, the format forward. Uh, but you should, you should really think about um, different aspects like how is the performance, how interoperable it is with the rest of your code. If most of your libraries are common JS, you, need a you would need something to translate that ES6 code to a common JS format. Uh, so there's some constraints because, as I said, the entire ecosystem was built around CommonJS. So you would, for some time, need interoperability between those two formats. Yeah. Um, so you can still use a bundler with ES6 modules, right? Um, so I'm not sure about that. I think, you, yes, you can. I mean, bundlers, do, so yeah, that's true. That's really true. That's a good point. So you could, yeah, you could use uh, you could ES, you, you could use ES6 module just to get the benefits of tooling around static type checking, and then you could bundle it uh, using a bundler. So bundlers understand both ES6 and, ES6 and Common JS. So that's one option. Yeah, great point. Uh, I was talking about using ES6 natively uh, in the browser. That that's going to be a cool exercise. All right. Uh, Conclusions. I'm going to conclude. Now, nowadays, a lot of people work with standard platforms like Angular, React, Yeah. How do these, so when you write code, how do you write this thing, the preference of package using the modules for ES? Yeah, that's a good point. So um, I think um, you're right. Like there's a lot of frameworks, React, Angular, all of them are mostly written, would be in common JS. Um, but you could still write your application code in ES6, uh, is what I'm trying to say. Like, and, and most of the times, all these libraries like React and Angular, they provide an already bundled version of their uh, library. So you would already have a distribution wor distribution version shipped along with the a package, so that way you don't have to you don't have to bundle React. Like they would have an optimized version that's for the browser. So you probably want to use the distribution version instead of trying to um, use a module bundler. Yeah, but I mean I think the the module bu the bundler of your choice is up to you. I, there are like React kind of, for example, has Webpack in their startup project. If, if you go to React, the Bootstrap projects use uh, the, the React getting started or something uses Webpack. But you, you, should, you should feel free to use any bundler you, you like. Like Browserify has more uh, ways you can, more ways you can actually um, compose bundling and Webpack is a little bit, uh, is, is more convention driven. So it has a lot of things baked in and, but Webpack is kind of easy to get started with. All right, conclusions. The best is yet to come. I think uh, it's taken 20 years for JavaScript to release a module standard. And it requires a lot of hard work and perseverance from, re from a community of passionate individuals. And there's a lot more to happen in, in the JavaScript standards. Uh, there's going to be CSS modules, there's going to be JSON modules, there's a lot of exciting work. Feel free to engage in TC39 proposals, like challenge assumptions, be an early adopter, you can help move, you can be a part of the evolution. 
and raise the level of abstraction. Um, I think, um, with, as you said, with so many frameworks, so many choices of libraries, frameworks, languages, um, it's hard to get lost in, in the sea of like choice. But just remember, like all these options and choices are a means to an end. Uh, that is to write modular code. So pick, pick the tool that works the best for you. Like there's no right or wrong way to do modular code. And try to raise the level of abstraction in your everyday coding. Uh, one thing that I try to do in, in when I code is I, one of my friends gave me this advice is, you first get it done, and then you get it right. So you first just write it, hack it up, and then try to make it modular. But yeah, that's about it. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Yeah, I, I, can I, yeah, I think. OK. Um, so I think you could use NPM and Webpack. Uh, but I don't know how, how much of how the adoption would, uh, like how the migration would look like, because I haven't used Power and Grant. Uh, but I, I think it would require some amount of like, early investment in migration. But then, yeah, what, what kind of app? Yeah, like Webpack has a lot of uh, open source contribution. Um, Browserify, so at Netflix, I can talk about what Netflix does. So Netflix um, has its own bundling tool. Um, and we've, we've based it off, uh, so we write our own bundling tool, but some of the components of the bundling tool are based off Browserify. Uh, and we now are trying to also experiment with Webpack as, as a bundling mechanism. You would use them one over the other. So, uh, like browser here. Go ahead. Um, what is TC39? Uh, so TC39 is a um, very good question. So it is a ECMAScript committee that um, works on JavaScript standards. So a um, lot of a lot of proposals in the ECMAScript are debated in TC39. Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> we, um, so I think you can, like it's an, it's an open GitHub repository. So if you go to TC39, you can actually look at the proposals. You can raise a comment, uh, raise an issue. But like the members of the committee are actually, I think, corporate members. Yeah, they're mostly corporate members. But anyone in, in, in the open can raise an issue or look at the proposals. Very good question. So I said that, um, sorry, I said that ECMAScript mod, uh, ES modules only had uh, static exports, right? So you have to give a name. So let me just, uh, so you, can, you have to say export, uh, you have to have a named export. So you can say export variable foo, export function named something, right? So you always have named exports, but you can have one default export, which when you say default export, it doesn't have any name. Like you could just export default or an anonymous function. If you, if you put it as default, you, you don't need to explicitly give it a name. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so MDN has very good documentation on ES modules. It explains what's the use of named imports. So if you have multiple types, multiple exports, use named exports. If you're just exporting one thing, you could use export default. Um, yeah, because primarily like, ES modules has to have named exports for, because I, as I said, for static analysis and all of that, but you can have one default exports because then it's still easy to reason about. All right. Uh, hopefully, I didn't. I, this all all this made sense. Um, if you have. Oh yeah. Sorry, I missed the thank you slide. <laughs> oh.
what happened? All right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, so this is my Twitter handle. I'm not too active on Twitter, but I will answer any questions that you might have after you read the slides. The slides are available on slides.com. Uh, I can, I want to clean up a few things uh, after it's if it's after it's ready. I'll just post it on Twitter. But you can go to slides.com, Lalita Ayer, and look for evolution of modules. One thing that I wanted to call out was. Uh, Anything that's blue is a link. So for example, right here, you can click on this. I don't know why it's not working. And this will open the MDN documentation. OK, it's opening up here. OK, I sorry. Uh, because it's, so anything that's a blue is a, oh god. Yeah. And then uh, the other aspect that I wanted to call out when navigating the slides is, Uh, I have references in some of the slides, which are actually, I have some glossary which I'll try to fill up, but I also have references if you navigate down. Uh, so I'll, like, I'll try to put up the references for all of the slides if I can. And then the other thing that I can do is all the code samples in this exercise, I'll put it up in a GitHub project. And um, yeah, so once the slide is ready with all that information about GitHub and references, I'll put it, post it on Twitter so that you can look at it and follow, you can. So the URL is accessible Yes, it's accessible right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's see. Oh, I don't know. I don't think it's letting me zoom. Yeah. Yeah, so it's slides.com slash Lalita Ayer. And if, if in slides.com you search for evolution of modules, this is the only one, I think. Uh, I, I'll definitely add, okay, hold on. Let me see if I can just edit it right now. Yep, I'll do that. I'll definitely do that so that you can all access it. Sorry. So I'll also add it to the, I'll give it to the SPC organizer so that it's on. Yeah, any more questions? Um, I think we, we are almost out of time, but happy to answer any questions. Any more questions? Was this useful? I think I kind of was a little fast in the beginning. But hopefully it made sense. Uh, give, me, give me a minute. I'll just edit the slides. Uh, I don't know Thank you. All right. <laughs>